In a forgotten corner of Waikimiti Cemetery is an overgrown grave with the epitaph, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. No doubt expressing frustration at not getting justice here on earth. But to find justice, you must first uncover the truth. And in this story, the truth still remains a mystery. In the case of Horatio Haywood Fresherville Ramsden, that is his real name, Truth and justice have lain hidden for over 80 years. Just as his epitaph, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, is now obscured by the branches of this tree. He was buried in May 1916 after spending four months in the mortuary pending an investigation because Horatio met his death under very suspicious circumstances. On January 22nd, 1916, he was murdered on the slopes of Mount Eden. Although the world was at war, this case often overshadowed news from the front. An Auckland public, eager for every morsel of scandal, followed each new twist in the police investigation. The case had all the intrigue of a Sherlock Holmes thriller. And it was far from elementary. The facts that first presented themselves to the police were these. Horatio Ramsden was 24. He lived with his mother and brother in Nelson Street, central Auckland. He and his mother were very close. In fact, she would later tell police of her premonition that he would meet a terrible end. On his last night alive, Horatio left home at 6.30 p.m. When his brother asked where he was going, he was told to mind his own business. At 7.40 p.m., a workmate saw Horatio passing by here, the Beresford Street fire station, and he seemed to be in a hurry. 90 minutes later, Horatio would be dead. Just before 9, Mount Eden resident Charles Nichols left his home off to the new moving pictures. He heard cries for help, and was overtaken by a man running down the mountain. Charles Nichols went to investigate, but it was too late for Horatio. First reports treated it like just another Saturday night crime. But the autopsy revealed the full horror of the attack. 13 stab wounds in all, three had penetrated his heart. Some minor wounds were inflicted to Horatio's front. The doctor concluded he'd tried to defend himself, then got away, and that the fatal back wounds came later when his attacker caught up with him. This information, combined with the eyewitness account of a man seen running away, sent police off in search of a male attacker with a long knife. A search of Hillside Crescent, where the body was found, turned up no clues. Police then extended their search back up the lower slopes of the mountain, a popular spot for young lovers. A closer investigation turned up Horatio's coat. It was found just underneath this tree here, and it was spread out as though he'd been with somebody, perhaps the lady that he said he was going to meet. Apparently Horatio, wounded and bleeding, then staggered 30 metres down the hill. Further down here, a bloody handprint was found on a gatepost that used to be where this fence is. He was again stabbed at the gate, and despite severe wounds to the heart, he staggered a further 40 metres to where his body was found. When the news hit the streets, more witnesses came forward. But instead of shedding more light, the last movements of Horatio Ramsden became even murkier. A friend confirmed that Horatio had said he was going to meet a man who would introduce him to a young lady. A tram conductor said he'd seen Horatio get on at the Simon Street stop by Grafton Cemetery. He may not have been alone. He seemed to be in the company of a woman when he got off at the Tuppany stop at Hillside Crescent. Reporters began to delve into Horatio's background. Until six months previously, Horatio had been a regular churchgoer. He'd recently broken off a relationship with a young woman. 
and since then he'd been seen in the company of many different female companions. He'd enrolled for piano lessons but had only attended one. Was he creating a pretext to be going out at night for other nocturnal activities? The next person to come forward was a young man named James Aitchison. He said he was sitting with his girlfriend here. The murder scene was down there amongst those trees. He reported hearing a fight, wild animal noises that he said lasted between three to four minutes. But strangest of all, he'd heard a woman's footsteps running in the opposite direction to the man Charles Nichols had seen. It seemed there had been a man and a woman running away at the same time. Who were these people? What was their connection with Horatio? Was Horatio the victim of a random attack while meeting a lady friend? But if so, why didn't the woman come forward? Was his companion a prostitute he'd argued with? She attacked him and her pimp came to her aid. Or was Horatio's companion a married woman and they were followed and attacked by her husband? On the basis of the autopsy, the police were hunting for one killer. But in 1916, forensic pathology was in its infancy. These days, it's a different story. Dr. Kohlmeyer had already helped me unravel the Hamilton Axe murder case. I asked him to read the autopsy report on Horatio. He concluded that there were two attackers, not one. I think there were two people and two knives involved. Firstly, from in front, the knife that was used was certainly a narrow, short knife. A short knife, perhaps wielded by a woman? There's a stab wound to the left side of the front of the chest, which entered the chest just beneath that fifth rib and then into the heart, like so. But that's not what killed Horatio. Now, the injuries from behind are of a very much greater force in nature. The knife used is very much longer and wider. There have been at least five stab wounds described. One, we know, glanced off the spine, but the one that did the greatest damage entered the chest cavity on the right side, passed right across the chest to the left, and then entered the heart like so. That involved a great degree of force, and that, I think, is a man's work. So, a man, and the fatal blows were from behind using a long knife. Perhaps it was a bayonet, it was wartime. Was the killer a soldier? Was the woman attacker a prostitute? Dr. Kohlmeyer says no. Horatio would hardly take a bottle of perfume to a prostitute, and his wallet would surely have been stolen if a pimp was involved. So who were Horatio's killers? Were they known to him? Were they on the tram with him as he made his last journey? Or did they lie in wait for him on the mountain? Whoever they were, they got away with it, and they took their brutal secret to their graves. And what of the epitaph, Vengeance is Mine? Records show that it was requested by Horatio's mother and that she too is now buried here along with her beloved son. A mother who felt she got no justice put that epitaph there. We will never find out the truth either, unless someone out there has some information, perhaps an old letter or a diary found among family records. We would certainly like to know who killed Horatio Hayward Fraserville Ramsden. Next, four travelers walk into a deadly ambush on Mongatapu Mountain, the story of the ruthless Burgess gang. I pull into Dobson in the South Island. Around here, the name features prominently the Dobson River, the Dobson Township. Even Arthur's Pass is named after Arthur Dobson. And just across these tracks, what looks to me like a sacrificial altar. In fact, it's a memorial to one George Dobson, who was murdered on this spot. Sacred to the memory of George Dobson, government engineer. 
murdered here by bushrangers, 28th of May, 1866. Bushrangers. I was surprised to learn that we actually had bushrangers in New Zealand, but apparently they operated here during the gold rush days. And in the Nelson Museum, I found out something else. George Dobson was murdered by one of the most notorious gangs of bushrangers, the Burgess Gang. And here in the museum, they have a particularly macabre reminder of that gang, their death masks. Richard Burgess. Thomas Kelly. And Philip Levy. Career criminals from the old days. And if they look a bit serious, it's because these masks were taken shortly after they were hanged. And the leader of the gang was this man, Richard Burgess, a Londoner who had been transported as a convict to Tasmania. Burgess had already murdered four men before he came to New Zealand. He was not only extraordinarily ruthless, but also remarkable because he recorded his exploits. These are his memoirs. A step-by-step -step account of the gang's murderous journey up the West Coast. They're a chilling insight into the mind of a cold-blooded killer. Listen to his words. The confession of Burgess the murderer. Written in my dungeon drear this 7th of August, 1866. Selecting the West Coast as a field to carry out my nefarious pursuits, I must needs confess it that my plans were bloody. In 1865, Burgess came here to Hokitika. In those days, it was a rip-roaring mining town of 6,000, full of dance halls, pubs, mole shops, grog shops, and gambling dens. Burgess teams up with Thomas Kelly, Philip Levy, and Joseph Sullivan, three other Londoners with criminal backgrounds. The four hatch a grand plan to rob banks and escape to America. Trouble is, they need guns, so Burgess breaks into the police barracks and steals two revolvers. And to explain how he came by the guns, the devious Burgess invites a local publican for a walk along the beach here. All of a sudden, Burgess spots something in the sand. A revolver. What a lucky find. Of course, the police weren't fooled for a moment, but they couldn't make any charges stick, so they warned him out of town. The gang moves north to Greymouth. They're desperately short of money. A job has to be pulled. They decide to rob the Greymouth gold buyer, Mr. Edwin Fox. Now what happens next, no one outside the gang really knows for sure. In his book, Burgess claims that his deputy, Sullivan, and one other man decided to proceed with the robbery of Fox on their own and botch the job. Sullivan told Burgess that halfway through the robbery, it dawned on them that they had the wrong man. He was such a nice young fellow, Sullivan told Burgess, but I couldn't let him pass because he'd seen me without any disguise. So I took him into the bush about 100 yards from the road. I made him sit down and there, we burked him. I looked it up, it's an old fashioned word for strangling. Sullivan allegedly goes on, I raked a hole and put him in it, compass and all. The compass was the giveaway. The nice young man that they had just burked was of course George Dobson, surveyor for the Canterbury Provincial Region. It was the end of Dobson, but it was by no means the end of Burgess' plans. The banks of the South Island were entirely at the mercy of any marauders who liked to enter them, he wrote in his book. The gang quit Greymouth and they take a steamer north. They leave the boat in Nelson, armed to the teeth. Next stop, the bank at Picton. But that involved walking along this, the Mongatapu track. In 1865, it was just a pack horse track. After three days' walk, Burgess and his mates make it as far as Canvas Town and camp in an empty hut near Mongatapu, the sacred mountain. Here, their plans change. The gang learns that in a few days, a group of businessmen from Deep Creek plan to close up shop and move all their cash and gold across the mountain trail to the bank in Nelson. They decide to rob them, and worse. Says Burgess, 
If they never turn up at Nelson, no one will know the difference. Next morning, the businessmen load up a pack horse with their valuables and set off. They arrange for a friend to follow them a day later and return the horse. The four bushrangers are ahead of them on the track when they're overtaken by a tall bearded man carrying a swag and a shovel. It's old Jamie Battle, a 54-year-old flax cutter on his way to Nelson. The gang suddenly realise he's a potential witness and they rush after him. James Battle realises he's in danger and he draws his knife. But the men rush him and overpower him and drag him off the track into the bush. Burgess tries to strangle him. I took him by the throat and held him until he was dead, his livid eyes and blackened face staring at me as if to say, look at your handiwork. Medical evidence would later show that he was still alive when they buried him. The bloodbath on Mongatapu Mountain had just begun. On Mongatapu Mountain, the Burgess gang prepare for the ambush of the businessmen. They select a big rock to hide behind from where they have a good view of the track. This will later become known as Murderer's Rock. They clear scrub from around the rock and pile up dead branches to hide behind. Ominously, they also clear a path to get the bodies off the track. The Deep Creek men finally arrive. Kempthorne, Matthew, Dudley and DePontius walk unsuspecting into the trap. Burgess yells, stand and bail up, while Kelly moves in to block off their escape. The men are tied up and led off the track and told that they will be released later. This is a lie. Burgess records that the gang had decided the previous night that they would burk the whole of them. The men are separated and the killers begin their grisly task. Dudley is separated and strangled within earshot of the others who realize what's coming and panic. So the robbers abandon the idea of strangling the men. Mathieu is stabbed with a sheath knife, Kempthorne and DePontius are shot. They take the money off the horse and then they shoot that too. Even Burgess believes that what they've done cannot be paralleled in atrocity. Not that the robbers are burdened down by conscience. We went on our way, not rejoicing, it's true, but still enacting the tragedy over again. After burning incriminating letters and papers from the dead men's swag, the gang divvy up the cash. Each murderer gets 80 pounds. They walk down to Nelson to catch the next ship out, confident their crime will remain hidden in the dark forest of Mangatapu. The police order a search for the businessman when the friend who went to bring the horse back reports them missing. These sketches were made by one of the searchers. Eventually, there are a hundred men searching the bush along the Mangatapu track. A reward and a pardon are offered. It is widely believed that the missing men have met with foul play and Burgess and his men are the prime suspects. They are arrested, but they say nothing. They make no attempt to account for the large sum of money they have on them. So long as no bodies are found and Burgess and the men keep quiet, they're safe. The police separate Levy from the others, hoping that he'll cave in, but instead it's Sullivan that takes fright and confesses. He reveals where the bodies are buried in return for a pardon, and they're found two weeks after they went missing. The murdered men's bodies are carried out and buried. Thousands attend the funeral. All the gang except Sullivan are charged with murder. The trial attracts so much interest that it has to be shifted from the courthouse to the provincial hall for more room. In jail, Burgess begins his infamous autobiography. In less than a month, he feverishly writes 50,000 words. It's clearly aimed at settling the score with the treacherous Sullivan, who has been pardoned and given a reward of 200 pounds. In it, Burgess revealed the hitherto unknown murder of Jamie Battle, for which Sullivan had no immunity. The jury took less than an hour to find Burgess, Kelly and Levy guilty and sentenced them to death. Next day, Sullivan was put on trial for the murder of Jamie Battle, found guilty and also sentenced to hang. But because he cooperated with the police, Sullivan does not meet the hangman. His sentence is commuted. 
but there's no reprieve for the rest of the gang. The hanging is set for the 5th of October, 1866. Burgess calmly walks up the steps to the scaffold and kneels under the middle noose, kissing it with the words, I greet you as a prelude to heaven. Levy joins him without any fuss. Kelly, however, is hysterical, doing everything he can to avoid the rope. His last words go on for so long, he's finally told to shut up. Even on the trapdoor, he screams, don't be in such a hurry. Burgess mutters to him, shut up and die like a man. And so ended one of the bloodiest chapters in New Zealand criminal history. The citizens of Nelson obviously felt that the murders should not go unmarked and erected this monument to the dead men. There was much argument about what the inscription should be. Finally, it was decided. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. This program was made for TV1 with the help of your broadcasting fee so you can see more of New Zealand on air.